everyone. Thank you for coming out this afternoon to learn everything and anything you ever wanted to know about dinosaurs mm -hmm. and to learn there's actually dinosaur evidence in the state of Maryland. First of all, I want to thank our guest speaker today, Dr. Stephen Godfrey. Would you just stand for me? And I can't emphasize enough the wonderful, wonderful relationship between our sister museum at the Calvert Marine Museum and the Bayside History Museum. Stephen represents the epitome of everything that is good about museum people. He offers, <laughs> he offers his time, commitment, energy to those of us who are not scientists. Because if you've been to the Bayside History Museum, we're a cultural history museum, whereas our beautiful Calvert Marine Museum is really a scientific museum. I also want to thank and acknowledge Calvert Libraries. All of our programs are sponsored in conjunction with Calvert Library. And I see Robin here today, so I'm going to put you on the spot. Stand up, Robin. Our Calvert Library Bayside History Museum and next month we hope the same amount of youngsters come back because we're going to have everything sharks by another one of our Calvert Marine Museum paleontologists. So have I embarrassed you enough, Stephen? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> come on up, Dr. Godfrey. This one is an upcoming talk at the Calvert Marine Museum. So anyone who has a, an ongoing interest in uh, paleontology, uh, Dr. Holtz is an expert, and uh, it will be a great talk that he'll give on, on the Tyrannosaurus Rex at the very end of the age of dinosaurs. And then, uh, as uh, Gracie just mentioned, uh, John Nance, who is our collections manager at the Calvert Marine Museum, he's here this afternoon. <coughs> he'll be presenting on the shark skeleton that we found uh, within two miles of here on the Gibson's property. And uh, so that's a great talk and uh, very interesting as we continue to work and research that the fossil find. And one other talk that I would like to bring to your attention is uh, in April by uh, Dr. Robert Hazen. Uh, he, uh, you may have seen his program, uh, Earth's Rocky Start, Life, Life's Rocky Start on the Nova PBS. He's going to be a guest lecturer at the Calvert Museum. So thank you very much, uh, Gracie, for the invitation. It's my pleasure to uh, present uh, at your request here this afternoon. So this afternoon you actually get a double header. Uh, I've decided to insert uh, this initial part. This is sort of the, the opening act uh, to, to talk about dinosaur footprints at uh, the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. So both projects are basically like stories that I want to tell you about uh, the practical side of paleontology, how we do what we do, and how we get to the results that can be published or put in, uh, on display or end up on, on the internet. And uh, both projects kind of just landed in my lap unexpectedly, but both of them I couldn't say no to because they were things that I was sort of passionate about and really enjoyed doing. And so the first one is, uh, has a strong emphasis on the intersection between art and science. So I really love art, uh, painting, and doing sculptural work, so you'll see that uh, throughout this, this first half of the talk. So I'm going to tell you how uh, I ended up with this model that is sculpted. And uh, this is actually uh, a recreation uh, of the head of an extinct group of, uh, of Mesozoic marine reptiles, animals called plesiosaurs. And I'm not going to go through the details of this, but I just want to say that here in Calvert County, we also get to play with the big boys. And so it's my pleasure to have been able to collaborate with colleagues both here in the United States and in uh, Chile and Argentina, because this animal comes from uh, close to the South Pole. So plesiosaurs, just by way of introduction, are a group of Mesozoic marine reptiles, and they're all extinct today. And you can see that they come in two basic forms. Uh, the pliosaurs are these ones that had enormous heads and short necks. And so they were macro predators. They were hunting large animals uh, up to their size. And then there are other plesiosaurs, which have these very long snake-like necks and much smaller heads. All of these plesiosaurs that are shown here were hunting single animals, one individual at a time. 
None of them were filter feeding. None of them were bulk feeders like baiting whales uh, do today. This is a lovely mount of the Plesiosaurus British Museum of Natural History in London. And you can see that they're characterized by having four limbs, which are very much like flippers. And so they were flying through the water, moving their flippers like sea turtles or penguins, or maybe even like uh, sea lions. And I know you all know about the dinosaurs because you know about the existence of the Loch Ness Monster. And I'd love to do a digital art. You can actually insert Sasquatch in there with me. <laughs> I would love for this animal to still be alive today. I seriously doubt that there's a plesiosaur still in that, uh, in that lake. Uh, man, if there was, a, you know, I, I would find that I would fantasize it. <laughs> So plesiosaurs show up in the fossil record at about the same time that dinosaurs do. And so they characterize, they're one of the characteristic animals of the Mesozoic era. So this part of Earth's geologic history, this is sort of a classic timeline spiral that begins with the formation of the Earth about four and a half billion years ago, and here we are up to here today. The sediments that occur along Calvert Cliffs are much younger. They're, they're here, the Miocene epoch. Okay, so we're, we're much further back in time. And so plesiosaurs show up here at the end of the Triassic period, and they, exist until, they existed until the very end of the age of dinosaurs. And they became extinct at the same time as the large land-dwelling uh, dinosaurs uh, did uh, about 66 million years ago. So this is a lovely uh, artist rendering of uh, some plesiosaurs. And uh, what I wanted to draw your attention to is the way in which the teeth interdigitate. The teeth in the lower jaw mesh with the teeth in the upper jaw, kind of like this, your fingers together. And that's characteristic of animals that are, that are feeding on fish, slippery sorts of things. And so they're using their teeth to kind of snag them quickly. They're not processing the food in their mouth. They're just kind of snagging a hold of it, snaggle tooth like and then swallowing the animal pretty much whole. There was a woman that asked me, earlier about uh, stomach stones. So plesiosaurs, uh, we do know that they had gastric stones, like they were using them very much like uh, birds will peck and pick up um, little bits of gravel and they'll hold them in their crop and they will use that, sorry, then the, the, the stones move into their gizzard and it's muscular and helps to grind up the food. Well here in this illustration you can see that this mother is, uh, is showing uh, her offspring here that they need, she needs, they need to pick up stones to sort of keep them uh, in, their, in their gastric mill to help break up their food. We know that they did this because we've actually found skeletons where stomach stones are present. Now I've mentioned that this is the typical way in which plesiosaurs, the, the, the teeth of clue, they come together. But right at the very end of the age of dinosaurs, there's this one small group of plesiosaurs which are doing something completely different. And this is a new group of plesiosaurs that's just come to life, and they're found down around uh, the South Pole. And you'll notice here in these artist uh, restorations that were sent to me by uh, the senior author on this paper, uh, Robin O'Keefe, at Marshall University in West Virginia. You'll notice, oops, I want to back up, sorry. You'll notice the teeth on the lower jaw, instead of pointing upward, they're actually angled down. And so when the teeth came together, right, when the jaw was shut, you'll see that the teeth don't interdigitate. And the teeth are quite delicate, and they can fall out relatively easily. So I'm going to continue with the presentation, and you can think about what this kind of plesiosaur might have been doing. So as I've mentioned, these plesiosaurs are found uh, uh, in Argentina and Chile, and they were first named after uh, where they were first found, on the island of Seymour. So this is an animal called uh, Morternaria seymourensis. Uh, uh, <coughs> so this is what the uh, what, what geologists think the Earth looked like uh, towards the very end of the age of dinosaurs. And this just shows uh, Seymour Island here in the Antarctic Peninsula. So out of the blue, I received an email from Robert O'Keefe who says, I've got this really strange plesiosaur. It's so unusual, I think we can do something really interesting with this in terms of a visual restoration of it. 
would you have an interest in making um, some illustrations, a life restoration of what this plesiosaur might have looked like when it was alive? And of course, not expecting it, I was flattered at the offer, and of course, it was something I wanted to do, and so I said, yeah, sure, I'll, 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 I'll attempt to do an artist's rendering of what it might have looked like. And so he sent me this illustration, well, it's what looks like this. And so this is what I had to work with. So when you start to do this kind of a project, you're an artist, you want to look at lots of different animals, right? And so the present is the key to the past. And so when we're doing a project, like this, you look at lots of different animals to get ideas about what the eyes are doing, you know, what the folds of skin are on the eye, what the shape of the iris and pupil colors are, what the skin here at the back of the mouth is doing because there are muscles right behind here, the texture of the skin. Uh, this is uh, a Loranid lizard. This is a Moravian Moana that lives in the Galapagos Islands. We even look at uh, crocodiles. Obviously not live ones, I wouldn't look at them. They just uh, <laughs> pretty well. And uh, since he wanted the mouth open, of course I spent a lot of time looking at you know, the color and the texture and shape of what's going on inside the mouth here and the skin along the side of the mouth being open. These are typically things that you focus on just when you look at, look at a photograph of a crocodile like this. Right? But when you're tasked to, to take this information and put it into uh, an extinct animal, so that extinct animal looks convincing, right? you, you spend a lot of time focusing on little tiny details like that. And I really enjoyed, really enjoyed that. It really makes you look closely at the morphology of an animal. You look at eyes, the shape of the eye, the color of the eyes, all of that detail. Uh, we, we didn't go with the crocodilian type eye in the end, but uh, I was fascinated by looking at the folds in the skin. How was I going to reproduce all of that? Also looked at whales. We ended up going with a whale style eye, and even the color inside the mouth, so the pink colors inside here. I had to be told it was pink because I partly colorblind, so. Um, so in Photoshop, I decided, well, I'm just going to, I thought, I'll just do this project in Photoshop. And so, I drafted this illustration, and uh, quite frankly, I was really disappointed with it. It just like it didn't look convincing. It was like, okay, it's sort of hope. And I did another one, and it was like, well, this isn't much better. But it was interesting. I did like uh, the kind of folds in the skin here because um, maybe these animals had like a larger throat pouch, and I liked the way that was looking. I didn't like the top of the head. The eye wasn't too bad. The teeth were nice. This worked pretty really well. The skin here along the side of the mouth. Uh, it just wasn't like convincing, right? You can tell it's a, like an illustration. It's not like this is the real animal. And uh, Robin didn't like uh, Robin didn't like the colors, and so we thought, okay, we're going to change the color scheme. And so this is just a quick and dirty idea, like, okay, do you want this kind of color? So we went back and forth lots of times. You know, I would send him something, he would send it back, and, and that's how we kind of improved the, the final product. And quite frankly, I'm old school, and so in the end, I thought, okay, I cannot do this just in Photoshop. Photoshop is a program, right, that allows you to manipulate images digitally and create artwork. And so I thought, I just have to make a model. I just have to make a, like, a life model. And so basically, I just took some wood and I made this little wooden frame and this little arm comes out here and there's some uh, narrower, slender pieces of wood that come down and help to support the plaster scene. This is plaster scene. It's a silicon-based clay that you can buy uh, in a store and kids play with it. And when I was a youngster, I spent a lot of time sculpting um, plaster scene like this. In fact, my parents would let me bring it to church and I would sit, you know, and be quiet and I would sculpt the people around me and often they were like kind of grotesque caricatures of a preacher or people around me. So I had great fun. But that's sort of uh, where this interest in, in, in sculpting came from. So this is uh, the, the, oh, probably, oh, I don't know, two or three hours into the, the, the initial sculpting uh, attempt. And this is my youngest daughter, Brianna, and she's laughing because um, I left it on the table one evening and went to bed. And when I came back the, the following morning, uh, there were these dally like you know, little mustaches <laughs> put on by my oldest son. And so I thought, okay, it's too good to, to not take a photograph of it. <laughs> so I brought with me some of the sculpting tools that I used. And I've also brought some of the plaster scenes. So anyone has an interest after, I can lay the plaster scene out. And, and these sculpting tools uh, are used to apply and to trim and to change the shape of the model. But these here, you'll see they have a texture on them. And uh, these are just made by taking a, a two-part epoxy putty. 
and putting it onto a metal rod and stick. And as it, as it starts to cure, as it starts to harden, I just would press into it various things or make it different shapes. Right? And then you can take those, and these are like negatives, like the little texture balls. And then uh, you can sort of press it into the plasticine because the plasticine is relatively soft. And you can heat the plasticine with a, with a hair dryer, and so it makes it, it doesn't, it's not a liquid, but it, it softens it up. And so then you can roll those texture balls, and so you can create folds and wrinkles and different kinds of textures on different parts of the skull to give it that sort of reptilian, realistic, life alive kind of skin look. Uh, oh, I'm just going to go back one. So you'll notice the eye has an eye in here. So typically, if you're doing a high-end sculpture, you'll go and you'll find a glass blower to make you a beautiful eye. Well, I didn't have time to do that. I was so depressed and hurt and hurt. So I thought, where can I find eyes? So I went off to Michael's, and it was just before Christmas. And so I found these really interesting LED Christmas decorations. And so <laughs> <laughs> That's right, science. <laughs> And uh, I couldn't use the plasticine to make the teeth because the plasticine is too flexible. And so I used the polymer clay, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And I, of course, I used the white version here. And I just cut it off and you just roll it out like you're making little snakes like you would in plasticine. And you cut them. And I made one end really pretty pointy. And I baked them in the oven for 15 minutes at 250 degrees. And then you push them into the plasticine. And what's nice about pushing them into the plasticine is that because the plasticine is deformable, well, it almost looks like the tooth, the root of the tooth is in there. In fact, the root of the tooth is in there, but I didn't have to sculpt, right, those individual little curvies. I just let the root, root of the tooth kind of make its own little textured surface on there. And so here is an early version. I changed it a little bit. Uh, I really liked the really long teeth there, but they were too long. Robin said, no, no, those teeth are too long, so I had to shorten these up. The lower ones look were fine. So here we're getting closer to, to the end. Um, so this is the plasticine model. You see, I didn't make very much of a neck. Um, and then it was time to paint it. So typically you don't paint plasticine, but you can. I just primed it with a white uh, paint. And then, uh, oh yeah, we decided on the, the, type, the shape of the eye. We went with kind of a whale-like eye. We don't know exactly what, we don't know at all really what, what a pleaser saw an eye would look like in terms of its minute detail. But we settled on, on this type of eye. And uh, the, the color for the head and the modeling underneath was based uh, in part on the large leatherback turtles. He liked so the dark on top and the lighter underneath, and I was fine with that, so that's what we did. And so I used an airbrush. Airbrush, you put the paint in here, and you've got compressed air that comes up through here, and you press this little button, and then it sprays air out, and it carries some of that paint with it. So you have like a, a spray paint that you put on. And apparently, if you want this flawless look, you can apply your makeup with the hair. <laughs> I mean, it works for me. So here I am in my outdoor studio last uh, December, I guess. We've had a relatively mild winter. And you can see that I'm applying a uh, nice deep purpley color here with, with my airbrush. And uh, so it worked very well on a calm day. What scale is your bottle? It's half, half size. So this is, uh, was the first kind of rendering of it, and I sent it to, to Robin at Marshall University, and he came back and he said, no, I want the throat even, and so he, he kind of put this white patch down here, and he said, I want this dark line through the eye here, I guess, to make it look more sinister, mm -hmm. and he wanted some of the skin cut out right here. I told him, no, I can't do that. It's like too far gone. You, you missed it. It's gonna, you're going to have to live with, with the mouth kind of skin being that, that deep. So uh, there was some to and fro. And so here is essentially the final version of, of the, the, the rendering. The color is, is different because it was photographed under different light. And in Photoshop, I was able to add uh, some more detail here to the eye and tighten it a little bit. And then he said, well, wouldn't it be neat if we could have the jaw shut? I can't shut the jaw. It's a plastic model that's got wood and I can't cut it apart and close it. And I thought to myself, I wonder if I can do that in Photoshop. And I've never done anything like this in Photoshop. And so I, it's kind of it's been good for me because it's sort of pushed me uh, to learn more about Photoshop. And in fact, all you have to do is you, you just, there's a, there's a command, you can sort of cut out a section. So here I cut out that part of the jaw. And then you can kind of just like slam it up in its eyes. And then you just go, you sort of blend the two together. And there it is, the jaw shut. And uh, so there's the, yeah, I'm sorry, back and forth. <laughs> And so here's a three-quarter view, and of course you can do the same thing. Now we don't know what the tongue looked like inside the mouth, but we did add a tongue. It's not a huge tongue because 
tongue is anchored to bones, your hyoid apparatus, and we don't have any evidence for hyoid bones being preserved in freezing salt. But again, here you can close the mouth. And again, it's amazing what you can do with this sort of layering in the Photoshop just to make it as a look. So here's the top view of, of the same model, and you can see the dark line coming down through here. So I can give it kind of that sinister look that, that he was after. So again, uh, working in Photoshop, you can put, the th put this thing under water. And so here's a, an image off the internet, uh, and uh, then you can just sort of put your, your model in there. I'm not entirely happy with uh, the, the light here reflecting off the top. Again, it forced you to look really, really closely at images of, of of sunlight dappling or rippling off of, reflecting off of uh, organisms underwater. And so uh, this is an earlier version of the more recent one that, that I've uh, got. And so this has been a really great project and it's ongoing and so we hope to submit the paper. And we're hoping that these visuals will, will, will capture, you know, that the editor and they'll say, yeah, we want this publication and, and uh, it'll get out there. Uh, so um, I started out by, by describing the, that uh, you know, these teeth are very sort of unusual in the way they close, they don't intermesh. And so does anyone want to hazard a guess as to maybe what this kind of plesiosaur, this group of plesiosaurs was actually doing? And I'm kind of giving you a hint by showing you this photograph of a gray whale. Yes? Well, you said they're down in Antarctica, so are they scooping through ice and silt and stuff to get the fish? They're not going through ice. The teeth are too delicate. Mm -hmm. So what gray whales do is they're one of the baleen or filter feeding whales. And instead of plowing into a large school of fish or krill, they actually go down into the mud in the bottom of the ocean and scoop up the mud and use their baleen, which is short and fairly uh, robust, to squeeze the mud kind of as a slurry out through the baleen and keep the food in the mouth. So they're doing that. And so when you see ocean floor where gray whales and have it, it's all popped with these holes because they're going down kind of like, you know, toddlers and picking up the food that's on the bottom. And so, right at the very end of the age of dinosaurs, this group of plesiosaurs, which had, which had lived for 100 million years on Earth, finally clued into, you know, there's another way of making a living. We don't just have to catch animals singly, single fish, right, or, or larger animals. I can go down to the bottom and there's a food resource there that I can take advantage of. And so their, their, their skull has been changed in its shape to make a higher arching palate, broad sort of open jaw like this where they could scoop up more material. Now they didn't attain the same level as gray whales or or, or, or rock wolves, the big baleen uh, whales, the like blue whale, like feeding on millions of individuals. But they had kind of figured out that there was this other way of making a living. And so that's just a really neat story I think this type of plesiosaur uh, tells us. Now unfortunately, 66 million years ago, there was this asteroid that came in from outer space, right, it was 10 miles across, and it plowed into the Yucatan Peninsula, and it obliterated 75% of all the life forms that existed on Earth at that time, including all the large dinosaurs, all the large marine reptiles, the plesiosaurs, ichthyosaurs, um, uh, nothosaurs, so gone. And so we don't know what might have happened, right? if this group of plesiosaurs had continued to exist on Earth, if they would have evolved to the extent uh, that uh, we see today in the alien whales. Okay, so that's the end of the first um, half of the talk, and it's going to check out time-wise. So there are several ways to study um, extinct animals. And of course, um, most of us would, would, would recognize that, well, the, the ideal way is to find uh, the fossilized remains of their skeleton. Right? There's a lot of information there, and it tells us a lot about the animal. But I'm going to focus today on another way of studying extinct animals, dinosaurs, here in the state of Maryland. Uh, and these are footprints that are found. Because, quite frankly, the bone record in the state of Maryland is dismal uh, compared to uh, some of the western states, where there are just literally thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of tons of dinosaur bone. When I used to live in Alberta, we could go on any day, because we lived in the Badlands, and we could collect dinosaur bone if we wanted to, like little bits of stuff, and petrified wood. It was all over the place. And so here in the state of Maryland, it reminds me of when I lived there, and the Japanese would come over, right? And they were like fanatics about like dinosaurs. Um, but in Japan, because it's a, a volcanic archipelago, right? There's virtually no rocks from the end of the age of dinosaurs, from, from the age of dinosaurs in Japan. And so whenever they find a dinosaur fossil in Japan, they're very excited about it and they build a museum. So here in Maryland, we haven't done that quite. 
fanatical about dinosaurs, but anyway, so but but dinosaur footprints are not but relatively are not common, but they are found much more often than are the, the fossilized dinosaur uh, bone bone remains. And I'm going to tell you about another project that kind of just dropped in my lap. And it, it, it exists of dinosaur footprints on the very campus of the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center up in Greenbelt, Maryland. So it is the home of mission control for the space, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. And it's also uh, where they are now assembling the, the uh, James James Webb Space Telescope. James Webb Space Telescope, thank you. In fact, uh, so it's over in this facility here where they're assembling it. I got a tour of this and it's just amazing to see these huge mirrors going together. And we'll come back and look at it. But this, this facility can now also brag to have one of the most important dinosaur footprint fossil finds, I'm going to say almost like in the world, because when I get into this, it's just like it, it, it blows my mind what would have now been found. And, and here is a photograph of the very first footprint that was found. So the star marks the location where uh, the, the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center is located. And you will see that it is here, right in the middle of this band of rocks, which uh, date from the Cretaceous period, which is the last of the three big periods that characterize the Mesozoic era. And so we would expect to find dinosaurs. Unfortunately, we don't find many because of housing developments and forest vegetation. This is not a lot of exposure. So here where we are, down here, we're sort of out on the further out of the Atlantic Coastal Plain, and these are the Miocene settings that are referred to. So they're much younger. Here we're sort of in the 10 to 20 million year old. Uh, here we're about 100 million years old. It's a much, much older rock. And uh, you've seen this figure before. And so here the age of the stones uh, that to crop out the massive facility here are about 100 and 110 million years old. So how do we learn about the discovery? Well, the discovery was made by this gentleman, Ray Stanford. Uh, back in June, four years ago, almost four years ago now. And he was uh, walking around uh, the campus, and not, so it's not open to the public, but his wife works there. And this gentleman, almost single-handedly, single has found virtually all the dinosaur footprints that are known in the state of America. He's, uh, <laughs> he is somewhat eccentric, and he's got some, in his house, it's just amazing, he's got stones like everywhere. But he also has these like little UFO things. And when I used to live in Texas, he was like passionate about uh, UFO like hunting and so he, he is eccentric, but he has an amazing ability to find dinosaur footprints. So he finds this one footprint, and uh, in August when this when they when they actually had a press conference on site, uh, when this story kind of broke, it became like the biggest story on the internet. The dinosaur footprints have been found at this NASA Goddard Space Flight Facility uh, back in 2012. And uh, from the shape of the footprint, you can see there are four prominent toes here. And so the heel print back here, but a foot, foot wide. Uh, this is a characteristic print for this kind of, uh, this kind of dinosaur, or the armored kind of dinosaur. So this is uh, a notosaurid. It's the family. And these animals, as you can see, they're armored. These little black things here, the spiky things. They're called scoops. And so here is an actual fossil that I collected when I used to live in Alberta, Canada. And this is from uh, a slightly a different family. Uh, they're called the Ankylosaurids. And these are the armored dinosaurs that had the big club on the end of the tail that they would have used to kind of like smash the legs of the dinosaurs. But these are a slightly older uh, group of, of armored dinosaurs. And you notice they have a sort of typical tail. But they have these scoops, which are bones embedded in the skin of their back. They're not attached to the skeleton. And in life, they would be covered with a fingernail-like material that would draw it out. So this would have had this little ridge here, would have had little uh, more prominent spikes on it. It would have helped to protect these animals on the flanks on the back from the attack of, of larger um, eating dinosaurs. So you can have a look at that at the end. So all we have in the state of Maryland uh, of these notosaurs are a few teeth. I mean, it's really pitiful. 
but we have this lovely footprint. So how does the footprint get formed? Well, the sediments in which the dinosaurs stepped are sort of a combination of a mud and sand. <coughs> so you can think of, of uh, Maryland at that time, 100 million years ago, it was warmer, it was tropical, so you have these large rivers that are flowing from the, the, the much higher Appalachian Mountains, okay, because they hadn't had as much time to erode, and so they're the height of the Alps at that time. And so these sediments are flowing out onto the Atlantic coastal plain and sort of forming vast deltas. And so this is from uh, the Skagit River Delta in Washington State. And again, with the with the, what you can do with Photoshop, you can sort of uh, insert some dinosaurs. So here's a dinosaur walking out on this on the surface. And in order for a footprint to be preserved, you can't have it in, in a high energy environment like where there are lots of waves that are breaking because you know you walk on the beach, a wave comes in, your footprints are gone. It has to be in a place like this, a tidal flat, where when the water comes in, it comes in very gradually and it won't, um, it won't erode or destroy the footprint because the footprint is a relatively delicate, ephemeral thing that just won't last. And so the dinosaurs have to walk over the surface. And then when the tide comes in, it might just bring in a little bit of sediment that sort of fills in that depression and continues to do that and preserves the footprint. And it also helps that this particular layer had a lot of iron in the sediments. And that iron helped to cement the clay together to make it like an iron stone. So it was very, very hard. In its natural habitat, it might have looked like this. At that time, Maryland was much warmer. It was tropical. And so here I've inserted this notasaurus into, into this lush um, setting. Oh, sorry. So this is now where, where a little bit of excavation was done. The initial footprint that I showed you was found right here. And so this gentleman is sort of cleaning it out. And they enlarged this area because there's another possible footprint down here that was found. So you can see it's about eight feet long and about three feet wide. And that was all that was exposed in that area. Well, the administration at NASA was, uh, was I, I wouldn't say that they were <laughs> thrilled about the discovery. <laughs> the reason for that is that where I'm standing taking this picture is a parking lot. And uh, there were plans to build a huge new building right immediately adjacent to this site. But because it's federal land, there's federal legislation that they were obligated to preserve the, this, this, this initial area that had been exposed. The Technological Resource Act demanded that they, they excavate it and remove it. And actually, in the wisdom, this is a really, really smart decision that was made, uh, it, was, it was decided that they needed to mold the surface and they needed to make a co an exact copy of it before it was jacketed and taken out. So this is uh, late in uh, 2012. All the individuals here are volunteers who work at, who work at NASA Dollar. And we had one day to kind of do a bunch of test pits to try to see if we could find uh, more of that same layer to see if that, that footprint layer was contiguous or spread out much further. We also, they also use uh, ground penetrating radar. So here's the, here, this tree over here, this little insert, is this tree back in here. And so here's the area that was exposed, the original dinosaur footprint that was found by Ray Stanford. And so here's the unit they used to, to sort of broadcast like uh, radar into the ground to see if they could follow this same ironstone layer. Mixed results, it wasn't terribly compelling. If I had to do this one day that NASA let us do this, I would have concentrated on this area up in here, and I would have pushed this back here, I would have excavated all this area to see how far that went. Once, we, once they saw this happening, they said, okay, that's it, you can't dig anymore. And so they weren't obligated to continue and excavate, allow us to just keep digging. You know, the they said, okay, we're just going like, to remove that. That's all you get to do. And I was very disappointed that that's just the way, the way it is. That's life. So, I'm going to tell you a little bit about making the mold, how we made a, make a mold of, of the surface. So because it was winter, we set up a tent. We can have a heater in to keep it warm. And I'm going to go through these quite quickly. Here is that surface. We've sort of dug around it so that we can like stand in here. And we're putting glue, special paleontology type glue. And we're using 5 minute epoxy to fill in any of the cracks so that the original footprint's down in this area. And so I'm working with uh, Michael, my son, and Perry Carson, who's a gifted artist that lives down in Port Republic. And uh, before we could put the molding material, so this, uh, this silicon rubber molding compound on the surface, we had to, we had to put over the surface uh, Vaseline. So all this light colored stuff is Vaseline. And we're using a blowtorch 
to warm it up to liquefy it so it would flow over the surface. So once we painted the rubber on, you could then peel the rubber off without just destroying the original surface. Here's the rubber, I mean the, uh, the, the torch that's being used. And also these, these, are, these are pillow cases right here that are filled with rice. And you know, if you put rice into a microwave and you heat it up, it's, so we had to warm the surface so that the, the rubber that's over here in these uh, buckets, once we mix these together, it would actually catalyze the set. So we had to warm the, the, the surface. So here's our propane heater and the steel we used to measure up the material. And here we're putting on the first layer of uh, the molding compound of, of the rubber. So initially it started out as uh, like a creamy-like liquid. And then as, once it set, we made it a little bit thicker. And so we then built up layers until this original surface was about uh, a half inch thick. Just go through it quickly. And then, because it's flexible, we needed to put what's called a mother mold on the outside of that. And that was made of plaster that was reinforced with these uh, electrical conduit. And here we're applying plaster to it. And here is the mold that we peeled, uh, peeled it off. Uh, here's the flexible, oops, here's the flexible, I'm sorry. So here is the flexible uh, silicon rubber mold, and here's the mother mold to keep it all uh, exactly in the shape that it was found. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit about the jacketing. So the jacketing is making the cast and wrap around it to preserve it so that we could lift it out uh, of where it was found. And so we need to uh, wrap a burlap and it's been soaked in plaster of Paris. You basically make like a cast that a doctor would put around a broken bone. So this is the first layer that you put on so the plaster of Paris does not get onto the surface where the footprint uh, was on. And uh, what was interesting is underneath one end of it, there was this really soft sand. Now this is from the age of dinosaurs, and it had not been injured, it had not been hardened, and so I could reach my hand up in there, and I could just kind of dig away like this. The roots that you see there are not prehistoric roots, they're modern roots from grass and trees that are growing down through. And I took this photograph because of these little openings right here. And when you look more closely at those, I was surprised to see that they're actually silk-lined little tunnels that were made by modern spiders that were moving down here. And these were the little tunnels that were moving through the sand that they were seemingly very happy to live in. Uh, and so, but at the other end, down here, the sediment had cemented together. It was exceedingly hard. It's some of the hardest sediment they've ever had to work with. It, it was like an iron stone. And so here is this really, really, really hard iron stone. And so this is the most difficult part of the whole process. Here, here's yours truly. And I've got this rock cutting saw with a diamond blade on. I spent just days kind of trying to grind through this to, to cut underneath the jacket so we could put the whole thing out so we could lift it out. But eventually, we got it jacketed. So here's the rock. Uh, layer where the footprint, you know, the two footprints were found, and the plaster that's been put over the top of it, and all of these straps wrapped around it so that you could come in and uh, lift it out. And you can see we, we couldn't cut underneath it because it was too hard. Fortunately, they came in with a really big forklift and just uh, kind of put the tines underneath it and lifted the whole thing up, and backed it out and put it on a big pallet, loaded the pallet on the back of the truck. And off they went to uh, a storage facility, and I'll show that to you in a minute. So we also were tasked to make a cast, a copy, that looked exactly like the original surface. Oh, I've known so long. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. So we brought the bowl home, and here you can see I'm working in the other part of my studio. <laughs> and we put plastic around because uh, my shop, my garage is just like filled with other junk. Uh, but anyhow, so this is a wonderful place to work. And we made the cast out of a very hard type of plaster. It's a statuary plaster called Pycal. And uh, what we did was we mixed the pigment, brown color, a powdered pigment, right into the plaster so that when we made the cast, it would look just like the original surface. And so here we're mixing up the plaster, and here we're starting to apply the liquid plaster to, to the mold, so we can make a copy of the cast. You can see this chocolate, looks like chocolate syrup that we're sprinkling down on the top of the mate. And we're building up the thickness of it. And in the end, we uh, then were just, to make it really strong, we, we laid in burlap, the fabric that had been soaked in this brown plaster, and we also laminated in these electrical conduit pipes 
could be built on the end so that it could be attached either to a wall or sit flat on the ground for study. And once all that's set up, we flipped it over, took off that big plaster um, mother mold, and started to peel back then the flexible silicon rubber cast uh, mold that we had made. And, sorry, blind everybody. And so here you can see the surface. The replica surface is here. And here is the silicon rubber that we're peeling off. And here's the finished cast. Loaded in the vehicle and delivered to, uh, to this huge warehouse at NASA where they keep who knows what. <laughs> and here you see the back, right, is the original jacket that we took out on the pallet. And here's the finished cast replica of that exact replica of that surface. And it was interesting, when I took this into this, uh, delivered it in this warehouse, I couldn't help but think of that scene at the end of uh, <laughs> <laughs> the The Ark of the Covenant in this crate, there's a million right here, off and like, wow, it's going to be lost forever. I'm thinking, that's probably the end of, of this project. <laughs> <laughs> this facility where, where we delivered uh, the cast is literally a stone's throw from where they're, they're building the James Webb uh, Space Telescope. And I, I include it just for, for, for the fun of it. So here is uh, a human for scale. Here is the Hubble Space Telescope. And here is the size of, of the James Webb Space Telescope that is slated to become operational to launch into space in 2018. And you look at this and it's like, what a strange sort of design. What is this stuff down here for? When it's sitting out in outer space, uh, it's going to be much further away from, from the Earth than in space, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. They had to shield it from the sun's rays, from the sun. So this is basically uh, um, a shield, a uh, shutter, like just to protect it from the damaging rays and the interrupting light from the sun. And what's really also impressive is the size of the mirror compared to the size of the primary mirrors in the Hubble. So here it is, the Hubble. And you can see that it's approximately six times larger in terms of light gathering ability. Yeah, so it's fascinating to see this. Um, we got the tour. So this is an illustration that I drafted because I thought, you know, they do have a museum, but they do have a visitor center at uh, NASA Goddard Space Science Center. And I wanted to mention that, you know, maybe you should put it on display. And I, I imagine that there'd be, uh, you know, some text that would show the, the notosaur footprint that was found. And at the time, I thought, oh, maybe there's an ornithopod, like a duckbill dinosaur footprint that was found down here. And I thought, well, that's the end of this project, because they weren't really kind of keen on doing this. Well, that wasn't the end of it, because the man who found the original footprint, Ray Stanford, he's still in the picture. Here he is right here. And he convinced these guys at NASA to let him take the cast home. I couldn't see because I didn't know how to look. I couldn't see because I didn't know how to look. I couldn't see because I didn't know how to look. I keep, I, I, ever since, I, I, you know, you're going to love this. And I wonder how, how much other stuff in life that I don't see because I don't know how to look. Here's the surface, right? The painted surface as we delivered it. And you'll notice that on this surface, uh, this gentleman here, who's Ray Stanford, he sprinkled sand over the surface right? to highlight the footprints that might have been on the surface. It's just the magic that he works. He took a brush and kind of like sprinkled around, you know. So the arrow, the one arrow points at the original notosaur dinosaur footprint. Well, get ready. All these arrows point at footprints or, or trail tracks of footprints that are found on the surface. Let's start over on this side. Here you can see there's one, two, three, four, five, six, at least six of six chicken-sized little footprints of a small dinosaur walking over the surface. Here's another trail. Uh, right here, there's one, two, three, probably a fourth one there. Here's another one here. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, so one, two, three, four. There's another set here. One, two, three, four, five. Um, this is another footprint. We'll get to this in a minute. This is from a sauropod dinosaur. Uh, it's another like a nice, sort of reaching dinosaur type footprint. Uh, the real kicker is that there are mammal footprints on here, just like. <laughs> so here's the first one. Right? I just like just a close-up view, and you can see here's the surface that I painted, and I was oblivious to all this. I didn't see any of this because we weren't painting 
for the contour, we were painting to match the original surface. And the original surface gave no indication of the presence of these footprints. He sprinkled a little bit of sand on it, it's just what he does. He knows how to do it. He knows what to do so he can see what's there. Right? He knows how to look. I didn't know how to look. I was so angry at myself. I wish like, I would have found these. <laughs> you know how much of a blow to the ego that is? <laughs> so here's like a third one. Two, three, four, five, six, maybe over here. Little like chicken-sized dinosaurs walking over the surface. So Silurus is one of these small theropod meeting dinosaurs that's known from the state of Maryland. Put it in there. So the restoration down here is probably a bit large. It might have been a juvenile of one of these. We also can't rule out the possibility that it was uh, Archaeorthomimus, which is also known from the state of Maryland. It clearly would not have been an adult. The footprints would have been too large. But it could have been babies. A whole bunch of babies kind of running you know, over the surface. They didn't know the footprints. All on that uh, river at river's edge or tidal flat. This is a classic sauropod, the dinosaur footprint. So the sauropods are these long necked, small head plant eating dinosaurs. And uh, just to plug the, uh, the, the science center, right, in the inner harbor, if you've never been there in Baltimore, they have this beautiful restoration of Astrodon, which is the sauropod dinosaur known in the state of Maryland. And that skull here is a, is a, is a part of a skull uh, that resembles, so it's thought that Astrodon is in fact one of these kinds of dinosaurs, a brachiosaurid. So this is one part of the skull of a brachiosaurus that's at the Pym Museum in Chicago, so I can go through the details of that uh, at the end of the life. So they're obviously very, very large kinds of dinosaurs. Clearly that footprint is not uh, from an individual this size. I think science said they, they include uh, these footprints that were made. Uh, these are based on a location uh, in Glen Rose, Texas, where a large sauropod is actually being pursued or followed by uh, a medium dinosaur that they include. You can see the footage over here. Um, that's not in the you know, harbor. So here, here are the most amazing finds. They're not even dinosaur finds. They're these little like, they look like little alien, little like human handprints on the surface. It's like, you know, I don't think there's, there, there, I don't think anywhere in all, like all of paleontology are, are dinosaur footprints found with mammal footprints. I don't think that's known, like in the fossil rocks. And here he's, he's sort of sprinkled a little bit of sand. He's found like a bunch of, of what appear to be mammal footprints on the surface. So what kind of mammals were here at that time? Well, we know that multi-tuberculate mammals, these are uh, a rodent-like group of mammals that we hear. The, the lower jaw is characterized by having this really large, sort of cunning uh, premolar. They're probably a little bit too small, but I mean, there were some that were sort of groundhog size, so it's possible. <laughs> they were certainly would have been the right size. Um, um, opossums are a very ancient group uh, of mammals, these marsupials, and so uh, there are some Cretaceous opossums, and say they're probably uh, the, more, the most likely candidate. And here's a, here's a photograph I found on the internet uh, of an exhibit that was, that was um, uh, on display. And you'll notice here, here's, here are the bones of a sauropod uh, dinosaur, right, the toes. Right? They're bound kind of tightly together, which is very characteristic of a sauropod because they're so since they're so heavy, they can't kind of split it like this. They have to be like, very much like elephants walking around the floor. And And as they would have it, here's a little skeleton uh, of a triconodon, another little mammal that would look something like this, that uh, again would have been a little bit small for those uh, footprints that are found on the surface. Uh, just behind the original <coughs> find, here's the original notosaur footprint. There's this kind of strange five-toed footprint, and there's this one right here. Okay. And I have no idea what these are from. Uh, I mean, for all I know, they're from scratch. <laughs> <laughs> so to summarize, this Ray Stanford has found 50 footprints on this one slab we turned out. And it has the greatest diversity of dinosaurs and mammals known anywhere in the world. There are five su successive trackways with small theropods. The theropods are these guys here, the, the meat eaters, these little chicken sized ones here on the main surface. It's the first time that a sauropod trackway has been found with a notosaur trackway anywhere. And of course, we have 12 footprints of mammals, different kinds of mammals on the surface. So, just like amazing, amazing discovery. And uh, unknowingly, I sort of had, had a part in, in, uh, in this project. <laughs> so, uh, just to, to finish up, but, um, uh, this is a photograph of two interacting galaxies. 
uh, that collectively are known as the uh, ARP227 in the constellation Pisces. And they are a hundred million years, hundred million year, hundred million light years away from us. The light that we now see from these galaxies left those galaxies when those animals were tromping around here in Maryland on that surface, which is really amazing to me to think about you know, time and deep space and how this light is traveling so far. Here at NASA, they're doing the, they're looking, they're doing the research in this. I mean, I would love to shake those guys at NASA and say, do you understand that the godsend that has been sent to you? You have dinosaur footprints from that time, and it sort of links Earth science with planetary science? It's like, it's, I mean, thank you very much. You've been a great audience. <laughs> That's not something I've ever thought about, but sure, if you put if you put anything into what's referred to as a depositional environment, a place where sediments are accumulating, and they're unlikely to be eroded away or destroyed, sure, if they're stable chemically, and if what you put in there is going to last, it's not going to be affected by you know, acid or base changes or some other chemical property about it, if it's just neutral, it's going to sit there. Uh, indefinitely. So yeah, it would be possible to find uh, you know, evidence of our civilization millions of years from now, you know, out off the Atlantic coastal plain, where you have the abyssal plain, I mean the, the slope that goes down towards the abyssal plain in that section. Yeah. Uh, did Brains find these here trigger any new digs at the site? Or is it No, we've been from, from Bitten to that, that site is now underneath a huge concrete abutment for a pedestrian walkway from this new big building that was built. That's yeah, kind of sad, but at least we got that. So, yeah, we're very grateful for that. Yes? So if you didn't know that all those amazing um, footprints were there, why did you take such a large piece? I mean, it was in a particular Because of this one here, <laughs> but I didn't see it for a sauropod. I thought it was like, I thought that was a toe. This is the toe, and that was the toe of like a, a three-toed like duckbill dinosaur. And so yeah, I, I didn't. I mean, I didn't need to take all that. I said, ah, oops, let's just like take this. Mm -hmm. And I would have lost all of that. Mm -hmm. Really tragic. But like the contract was like you have to mold and cast on the surface, and I was like, fine, I'll do that if you want me to. I, I was so skeptical, like yeah, whatever. I mean, they're paying for it. I'll, I'll do it. And now it's like, oh. so right here. So now, where is, where is this located? Is uh, well, I think it's still at Ray's house. <laughs> <laughs> the original block is no longer in that huge warehouse. It's actually outside, which is not great, but it's, it's, it's wrapped. It's still in its original jacket. It's tarped. They're trying to raise the funds to actually have an archival jacket, which is a special way of preserving it made, so that it can be put on display. They are now hoping that now that all of this I mean, it hasn't been released. We haven't had a press release. We haven't published the paper yet. You guys are the first public audience to hear about this. Please, I beg you, do not, do not post it like anywhere on the internet. Um, but I mean, this is going to be really cool. It's really good to find. So that that will, I think, propel them to realize how important this discovery is. Yeah, the lady next to you. How does this compare with Dinosaur State Park in Connecticut? That's a very famous track. Well. So yeah, in Connecticut, they're blessed with this amazing diversity of superbly, highly uh, well-preserved dinosaur footprints. Um, I, I just love that site because there's so many of them, but there they don't have the diversity like in such a small area, and they don't have the mammalian footprints either. But I mean, that was going to be a highway. That's how they found it. Right. Right. So uh, the, the advantage they have there is that there are huge areas that are known to preserve uh, dinosaur footprints, and they actually built a museum just off of 91, Highway 91, that goes from north from, from um, New Haven, Connecticut, up to the Canadian border that we go when we go to Canada. But right off there, near, uh, adjacent to the Connecticut River, there's a museum that was built right over this huge outcrop 
where these beautiful, beautiful dinosaur footprints are found. And, and the quality of preservation is such that you can even see some of the skin texture, the scaling on the bottom of the dinosaur footprints. Large uh, three-toed dinosaurs, things like Dilophosaurus, that were talking around. So it's, yeah, beautiful. And it's been known for several hundred years. Ed Hitchcock, who was a, one of the early American paleontologist, documented the diversity of uh, dinosaur footprints. And all the yes? I came in a little late, so you might have, you might have touched on it. Is, are there particular soil types that are better for finding dinosaur footprints than others? We don't typically find dinosaur footprints in the same kinds of sediments where dinosaur bones are found. Um, this preserved because the original sediment had uh, a natural cementing agent in it. So this is a, the original surface is a mixture of a clay and a sort of a slurry of clay and sand. And in that clay, there must have been enough iron that it cemented, naturally cemented all the little particles of that sediment together into this really, really hard, thin layer that's only about two inches thick. And then underneath it was like, just like I said, beach sand. I could dig it, and unless, and, and, but the other end was very, very, very hard, where again, iron kind of cemented the sediment together. So there's a natural chemical reaction that happened that cemented this surface, obviously after the footprints were made. And did you see the photo? I have an image of that tidal flats. So the water would come in very, very gradually and, and deposited silt and sand over this. There couldn't have been any waves curling or breaking, right? The water just had to rise slowly, right? So that all of this, because these are so delicate, just the slightest like wave action would just erase all of this. So that, those are the kind of conditions, right? You don't have global catastrophic conditions preserving dinosaur footprints. They're very calm environmental conditions where you have the right kind of sediment that can, can um, basically receive the footprint and preserve it once it's taken out. So you have to have a certain water content, a certain plasticity to the clay, to the, to the sediment, and then an environment where, where they're going to be buried and preserved. So you have to have sort of all these things coming together to, to a foster the preservation of dinosaur footprints. I know a lot of soils have been mapped in the state. Are the paleontologists tend to look in certain areas? Yes. You know, you can go find stuff and avoid other things. Yes, you rely heavily upon what geologists have done, mm -hmm. and so you can focus your, your search, right? You don't you wouldn't go and look somewhere, yeah, where we have no chance of finding. So here on the Atlantic Coastal Plain, I'm sorry, uh, along Calvary Coast, we wouldn't look for dinosaurs because there just were no dinosaurs you know, found in the mines and they'd all become extinct because that birds which are living sentence, but I'm referring to the Mesozoic. Okay, if anyone wants to see the, what I have over here, I can pull up the plaster scene and, and you guys can sort of roll. I should have brought, um, do we have something? I, can, I guess I can wash the table afterwards, but uh, anyways, thank you very much. <laughs>